Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation, Outdoor Oklahoma. Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. Today I'm at Lake Arcadia on one of the many areas that the Wildlife Department actually owns and manages. Recently, this area has been receiving a lot of attention to help manage and manipulate the habitat for wildlife. Although unlike Arcadia, the vast majority of Oklahoma is privately owned. That's why the Wildlife Department depends so heavily on private landowners to help manage Oklahoma's wildlife habitats. And for those people that go above and beyond to manage their personal private property for wildlife, we like to recognize in our Landowner of the Year program. And recently we caught up with this year's Landowner of the Year as he helped to manipulate quail habitat at the field trial grounds in Ardmore. This area is a little known jewel in Oklahoma's crown and most of the American Kennel Club's registered hunting breeds hold their field trials on these grounds. So we headed down to Ardmore to take a look at the finals for the Weimariner field trials and talk with this year's Landowner of the Year, Chris Kalbeck, and find out why managing for quail is so important for this sporting event. In the uh, before shot area that we looked at today, um, in the foreground you saw some dead trees that were from a prior burn years ago. Uh, there are some eastern red cedars that have popped up in the foreground uh, and along the edges a lot of uh, um, the uh, elms have grown in and to the extent that it's difficult to actually see the depth of them until you get into the middle of them. But what we're doing today is thinning that pasture out so it'll be prepared to burn, burn in the spring. People should be concerned about quail habitat. There's a, uh, Grant Huggins also had another wonderful little saying, there ain't nobody don't like quail. Uh, it's a wonderful bird. It has a, a, a very distinct need for five different kinds of cover and it, it, it must have all of them kind of contiguous. Species like little blue stem are very important for their nesting success. Um, they'll nest in other things, but that's uh, from ODWC research has shown that they prefer that, especially in the western part of the state. Forbs are just what is essential for al almost all wildlife species, and um, they rely heavily on those for their food supply. That if you can manage for quail, many of the other things are managed in the process and benefit many of the other focuses. Um, and so. Uh, to the extent that quail habitat can be done, prescribed burning is one of the most valuable tools and people need to not be as scared of uh, prescribed fire. If it's done correctly, it is done in a, a very managed environment and uh, prescription specifically and very rarely does a prescribed fire get out of hand. <laughs> Beverly. River, brace one, Izzy, brace three. This is where we have our national championships every year. The Weimariner Club of America holds their national field championships here every year, and we have since the 70s. What if um, the bird's running and we can't get it to fly? So a good dog knows the difference between what's called a pen-raised bird, a, a quail raised in captivity, and a wild bird, and they react differently. Like we come in with 500 birds, 500 quail for our field trial, and they'll be gone. <laughs> So everybody who comes in for field trials, like a little field trial, puts out 200 birds. And a week later is when our national championship Get starts. It. Get it! And Get there's no birds. We have to put birds out again. <laughs> so this will be wonderful if we can start That's inducing the quail to stay around and naturalize <laughs> and go wild. So you get a much better, more intense point more drive off a wild bird than you do a pin race bird. We love these grounds. They're wonderful. They're tough grounds for dogs, but for a championship, that's what you'd like to have. National Open <laughs> champion, <laughs> Sasha! <laughs> now, in the area where we had done previous tree thinning, um, down uh, south of where the field trial clubhouse is, uh, that area, 
uh, has a variety of different grasses in it already. It has uh, a, a very small populations of um, Chickasaw plums, sand plums, uh, and it has green briar and some little dogwood thickets, and those are all very good for quail. When we remove the trees, those have a chance to flourish back, and the grasses hopefully have uh, uh, grown. They'll have a little bit of chance to get some stand on them, uh, so we'll have a more improved burn for the spring. We would like to get the message out to the public in general, the different partners that are out there that can team up with Quail Unlimited as a charitable organization. Uh, we are applying for different grants in different sectors to try to team up with anybody that has an interest in habitat work. Uh, we want to focus on hands on the equipment, feet on the ground to get our birds in the air. And to that extent, by getting the message out through uh, Oklahoma Wildlife Department, through the natural uh, NRCS, um, what our hopes are is to find different funding sources because it is very labor intensive and very costly capital wise for the equipment ne necessary to do these tasks. Um, once the trees are thinned, it will be more of an annual practice of uh, prescribed burning, which is less capital intense but is very volunteer oriented. So by getting the message out, by getting the uh, educational value of this heightened, uh, we hope to in our Arbuckle Mountain area at, at a minimum uh, get the message out on what habitat management can do and hopefully the individuals will take that back to their properties uh, whether they're 20 acres, 10 acres, you know, 100 or 5,000 acres, they'll be able to use these same practices there. You know, Chris is right. Usually what's good for one wildlife species is good for many others as well. And one way that we find out how a species is doing is simply by counting them and getting a visual sense of their overall health. Well, recently, Damon Springer and his crew worked late in the evening out here at Arcadia to see how the bat population was doing. Let's see what they found out. We're at uh, Arcadia Conservation Education Area. It's on the south side of Arcadia Lake. And uh, it's a new area that we've kind of gotten that we're working on right now to work as an educational program area. And uh, one of the things we're gonna do this evening is try to trap some, uh, mist net some bats. And uh, we've also got some uh, Sherman live traps set out for some of the mice and some rats. And we're wanting to just kind of get a baseline as to what's available on the area. Uh, since we're gonna be doing educational programs, we need to kind of know where we're gonna be able to start with setting up some of our programs. And uh, of course, the bats and the, the small mammals are some of the things that people like to know about. So we want to know kind of what we've got, and uh, so we're going to be working on that tonight. We have a master naturalist group. The Oklahoma master naturalist group is going to be out here helping us, uh, and we also have uh, some folks that are here from the Oklahoma City Zoo. I've got the areas kind of marked already as to where we're going to put them, but what it is is there's some uh, sumac. It's all headed out. It's got a lot of seed and stuff on it, so we should be able to have some mice, you know, feeding in that area of rats. And then just on past it, there's a plum thicket. Very delicate. The net's about like thread. It'll break very easy. Just tie down a little. We could do it a little. We're setting some small mammal traps, so hopefully we can catch a few mice or maybe even a rat. We got them all there. It's called a mist net system is what it is, and it's a very fine, almost thread-like little nets that we put up on some posts. And uh, the bats, of course, they have trouble echolocating them, and uh, you know, they're chasing prey and bugs usually when they're coming through there. Bats are real delicate, the nets are real delicate, so you know, once we do catch one, we try to get them out of there as quick as possible. We'll do some measuring on them, you know, find out what kind of bats they are, and then we'll release them right back out into the area. Endorser profile of a single yeah. straight yeah. into with a nine. <laughs> ears, saying the ears are 25 millimeters or more. That's the forearm, the big bone right there. That's uh -huh. their forearm, and these are actually their fingers out here. And so you measure that from tip to tip.
Oh yeah. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get him out of here and we'll key him out and see what he is. If we need to, we might be able to identify him just by looking. All right, someone help me with the lid. When I put him in here, we just make sure the lid stays down. Ready? He's coming in. Put it on. Almost looks like a house mouse. <laughs> Oh, we can see him good through here. The deer mouse, of course, has the white feet and everything, yeah. so it cannot be that. So does the white-footed mouse. Yeah. So this guy's no white. Tail isn't bicolored either, which there's usually. Right, and they they do have a lateral line usually too. Eastern harvest mouse. Pretty sure it's the plains harvest mouse. Plains harvest mouse, which is different than the last. We had a white-footed mouse mm -hmm. last year on the one we got, mm -hmm. so that's good. We got a little bit different one. This one is an introduced species. Yeah, that's true. It was uh, introduced way back when the first settlement and then came in. They brought Norway rats in with them. So this one's a kind of an exotic species. This one's the Norway rat because of the, the longer tail, the scaled tail. It doesn't have hair and stuff on it. It's scaly. Um, it's the brown on top with the white belly and uh, its hair is you know, fairly smooth, it's not rough and coarse like the cotton rat would be. You know, if you participate in these nest box surveys and you have either a bat house or maybe a bluebird box like this, you need to check it every once in a while to see if anyone's home. There are many different species of birds that you can help the department monitor. And if you would like to participate in one of these nest box surveys, check out the information on the Watchable Wildlife section of our website at wildlifedepartment.com. When we come back, we're going to show you how you can attract a different kind of watchable wildlife of the four-legged type with the use of a food plot. When we come back, right after this week's Outdoor News Report. You know, another way to attract wildlife to your property is with the use of a food plot. And there's probably no greater expert in the field and science of food plots than Mr. George Edwards. Typically, when I'm looking at uh, developing a food plot, I'm not looking at Tamara next month, I'm typically uh, looking four months, five, six months in advance. So it's early to mid-spring right now, and we're gonna start looking at developing a food plot. And there's two stressful periods of time in the deer's life. One is January and February, and everything is dormant. There's not much to eat, and they're under stress. The other times that people don't sometimes think about is in July and August and first part of September. It's hot, it's dry, drought conditions, everything is stemmy, woody, and the pro protein goes down. But yet those bucks, those does, those fawns still need to have that high protein in order to uh, do well. The first thing a person needs to do in order to have a successful food plot to bring those big deer in and bring those turkeys in is do a soil sample. Now this is a core sampler. Now you can take a sharpshooter and do the same thing, but this is a core sampler for soil. You want to take and take a, a sample about six inches deep, put it in your bucket, and like I said it's best to take about 15 uh, samples per food plot so you have a good a composite representation of what's in that uh, area that you're going to work on. Take that composite sample and then take it to Oklahoma State at your, or your county extension agent, $10 per sample, and you tell them what you're going to plant, and in about two weeks you'll get the results back. Our next step is to prepare the ground for planting. I already know what uh, the soil sample requires, and I like to put down fertilizer just as I start to disc. That way it incorporates it into the soil, and in this instance, I'm gonna put down about uh, 100 pounds to the acre of 10-20-10. And you can see, you don't have to have a lot of expensive equipment to be able to put in your food plots. I mean, this is just a garden tractor and a fertilizer spread that you can get at the co-op or the feed and seed or 
your local uh, farm supply store. It doesn't take a lot of expensive equipment. You don't necessarily have to have a tractor. So now we've got the soil sample done. We've got our fertilizer down. Now it's time to put everything underground. We've now finished preparing the seed bed and it's now time to go ahead and plant. Just finishing up the uh, seeding of this food plot. The next thing we will do is go ahead and uh, drag it or roll it, and uh, that'll incorporate the seed into the ground. And really, now all we have to wait for is Mother Nature to give us some rain. Uh, this was a relatively inexpensive, low impact food plot that I developed. Now, we started this with a closing window of opportunity. We had just a, a narrow window to get the soil prepared, get it fertilized and planted. When we still had good moisture, we're two and a half months into this program right now. And uh, I've used a riding lawnmower to mow this. Uh, I did use a small tractor with a, a rototiller on it and then I used a roller to smooth it out, broadcast my seed, drag it with a piece of chain link fence. A lot of this stuff you may have around your place anyway. It doesn't take a lot of effort. The uh, stuff I have planted here uh, it happens to be, the blend happens to be power plant from the Whitetail Institute of North America. But we have uh, sunflower in here, we have Lab Lab, which is a high protein vine and it will grow on the stalks of the um, sunflower. And we, we looked at, you can see what the, the uh, leaves, what's happened to the leaves by the deer. They've nipped these off because they're, they're young and tender and higher in, in uh, food value. Then we'll have shortly, we'll have these seed heads mature on the sorghum. Uh, certainly it'll benefit uh, dove and quail and uh, turkeys a little bit later once it matures, but when it does mature, the deer are gonna uh, switch to that. We have clover in here, imperial white-tailed clover is planted, and historically, when I harvest animals off these food plots, they're not just fat, like everybody has seen. Gosh, they're really fat-eating acorns. These things have so much fat on them, they look like a marble bead. It's just incredible what good quality food plots can do for your wildlife. Well, we've bombarded you today with a lot of information of how you can manage your little piece of heaven for wildlife, but you're not alone. If you'd like some expert advice, the Wildlife Department will provide biologists to come out and help you evaluate your land's potential for wildlife habitat. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you somewhere new next time on Outdoor Oklahoma.